You are watching Grassroots Community Television, helping you make television people watch everywhere. Broadcasting on cable channel 82 in Glenwood Springs in Carbondale, and channel 12 in Aspen, Snowmass, Basalt, and Elgebel. Free over-the-air broadcasts throughout the Roaring Fork Valley. All programs can be watched anytime, anywhere at grassrootstv.org. Thanks everybody for coming tonight to Naturalist Nights. My name is Jim Kravitz and I run the winter programs here and some of the summer programs. And um, first I just want to let everybody know that Naturalist Nights is brought to us in a partnership between ACES, the Wilderness Workshop, and Roaring Fork Audubon. We also have some very fine sponsors on the screen here who allow these to be taped. And uh, also two, leave, two Leaves in a Bud who provide the tea out there. Anyway, getting that out of the way, I came to ACES in uh, 1995, and as an intern, I got to choose a special project. And we could choose from the birds of prey, or garden, or the trails, and one of them was the trout. So I didn't know much about trout. I had friends who were fishermen, so I chose cutthroat trout. And what I found out quickly was that ACES was doing a Colorado River cutthroat trout restoration project with the Division of Wildlife and Trout Unlimited, and we were building spawning habitat, and we had these, what we thought were native cutthroat trout here. So I just took uh, an interest in cutthroat trout right from the beginning, and, and it was really, really, it was unbelievable to find the stories that I found that uh, Jessica, our speaker here, uh, had, had uncovered about the cutthroat trout in the state. So um, I don't want to say much more. Next week, we've got bird banding with Amber Carver. So. Um, I want to just introduce, she's a biologist uh, interested in conservation and a DNA sleuth. Please help welcome Am <laughs> Jessica Metcalf. You can call me Amber. <laughs> you, you, you look like Amber. Right. Uh, well, thank you, and, and thanks for hosting me and inviting me. This is definitely a, um, a treat to come to Aspen. Okay. There we go. All right. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a story about the recent history of cutthroat trout in Colorado. And this is a story that we've unraveled with about a decade of research. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. I'm going to try to speak up. Is this better? Okay. Um, and since most of our recent work involves uh, uh, studying DNA from museum specimens, I'm going to first back up and tell you a little bit about the field of ancient DNA and conservation genetics in general, and then we'll move to the trout story. So first of all, um, I consider myself a conservation geneticist, and in the field of conservation genetics, our main goal is to prevent species from going extinct um, and try to restore species to their native range. And what we contribute to that effort as a conservation geneticist is we try to collect data about species native diversity and distributions. Um, but in some cases, populations of a species may have been um, either extirpated or have gone extinct or moved around heavily manipulated by humans uh, before we really documented their native distribution and diversity. And this is where historical data can be really valuable. Um, <clears throat> and historic data can come in, in many forms. It can be documents, um, actual physical specimens in a museum. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, DNA that's preserved in some of these uh, historical specimens and how that can be useful. Um, <clears throat> and so this falls in the realm of what a, field, a specialized field called ancient DNA. And I did my postdoc in, a, in an ancient DNA lab where we learned techniques for getting DNA out of dead things. Um, and so basically, 
that's what ancient DNA means. It doesn't have to be thousands of years old. It just is DNA from something post-mortem that uh, has a few typical characteristics. Um, the DNA is very scarce. There's not much of it left. It's degraded. It's low quality. Um, and it's easily contaminated by modern DNA. And so because of this, uh, we work with um, ancient with material that contains ancient DNA in very specialized facilities. And so this is a picture of the Australian Center for Ancient DNA, which is where I did my postdoc and where I did um, about half of the, the, the research that I'm going to show you today. And so this is a facility that's very similar to forensics level facilities that you see on shows like CSI. And so these are facilities that are sealed um, and the only airflow in comes through HEPA filtered um, vents and that keeps dust and anything that could bring pollen or anything that contains DNA into the facility out. Um, and we also have UV lights that go on when we're not in the lab um, to sterilize all the surfaces. And then we keep our DNA out of the material by covering ourselves with full clean suits. And so, um, <clears throat> Just to kind of clarify what's possible with ancient DNA, because due to the movie Jurassic Park, many of you may envision that we're in there getting DNA out of fossilized dinosaurs. Well, we're not. Um, <clears throat> our ancient DNA studies, if you look at a, a geologic timeline like I'm showing here, um, we're getting DNA out of just the very tip of this. So what we consider the late Pleistocene, which is that last ice age with mammoths and um, <clears throat> Neanderthals and those types of, of charismatic, charismatic megafauna, um, you know, into the Holocene, which is the, the, the era we're in now, um, and that includes up to historic times. So, you know, some of the early work, for example, was done on the dodo bird, which went, ex which went extinct in historic times, and they were able to get DNA out of some of the museum <coughs> specimens to show that it's part of the pigeon family, even though it looks very different than a pigeon. Um, and so this is the type of, these are the type of organisms we can study using this specialized technique. And so now I'm going to move to telling you about <coughs> the conservation genetics of, of cutthroat trout. And so first of all, um, I want to tell you just a little bit about, uh, you know, why cutthroat trout are, have declined so much in, in the United States. And part of it is just, um, <coughs> is that we've had a, a, an incredible amount of introduced fish in the West, particularly in the Western United States. So this is a, a map from um, a paper that was showing the percent of each state's um, fish that are non-native. So actually some, some states in the West have more non-native or, or introduced fish than they do native fish at this point because we've had so much stocking of, um, of non-native fish. And, and this is one of the many reasons why the native fish have declined, including um, cutthroat trout. And so just a little bit more about this species. Uh, so cutthroat trout are actually um, native to the, we the western United States, um, and it's the most uh, diverse species of trout in the United States, and um, it has a very broad range. Um, and because of the sort of mountainous and rugged topography, um, when <coughs> When cutthroat trout, when the ancestors of, of modern cutthroat trout um, moved from the Pacific Ocean inland over various glacial cycles over the last million or two million years, they became isolated in, in major drainages. And because of that, what we have today are subspecies of cutthroat trout that are fairly different. Um, they've been isolated for tens to hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and in Colorado, we have... Uh, we have three subspecies extant or alive today, and that includes the Colorado River cutthroat trout on the western slope of the Continental Divide, so where we are now. Um, and then the greenback cutthroat trout, which is shown down here in green um, on the front range, and then finally the Rio Grande cutthroat trout, which is native to waters that drain into the Rio Grande, so down the San Luis Valley and into New Mexico. And then we had one other fish called the, uh, one other cutthroat trout named the yellowfin, 
that was native to Twin Lakes at the head of the Arkansas River drainage, and that went extinct in 1904. And so what are the reasons that these cutthroat trout subspecies have declined? And pretty much across the board, all these subspecies have declined in the last 100, 150 years. And the major reasons were um, overfishing, and here's a, a picture of, um, these are pr pretty common to find these pictures when uh, European settlers first arrived. You know, it was just, e these, these fish were really easy to catch and they would literally um, fish them until there were no more <coughs> left in the stream. And so this is a, a picture showing, um, I don't know, a day's catch of cutthroat trout. These are greenback cutthroat trout. Um, and so, but other reasons, uh, mining pollution was a big reason. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and also, as we talked about before, introduced species outcompeting the native cutthroat trout. Many of these native cutthroat trout um, evolved in really high alpine streams without any other fish, and so they're not really well ad adapted for competition. And so of the 14 described subspecies, two have gone extinct, and most are protected either federally by the Endangered Species Act or um, by some sort of state protection. And so for the greenback cutthroat trout, which is one our state fish and it's native uh, to the Front Range, it was actually declared extinct in 1937. It was thought to be extinct for, um, over, for about 20 years. And then some small populations of cutthroat trout uh, started being discovered in sort of the, the late 50s, early 60s. And um, it was concluded that these were probably greenback cutthroat trout and that, these, uh, and that this subspecies had actually not gone extinct. And so <clears throat> then in 1973, it was added to the endangered species list, um, and then it was downgraded to threatened, which is its current status on the endangered species list. Um, and so from this, uh, because it was li a listed species, there was an intensive restoration program launched uh, with the goal of trying to um, restore the uh, cut greenback cutthroat trout to um, sustaining populations. I think it was the goal was 20 sustaining populations on the front range. Um, and so it was, it, was, it was heading towards this goal in the early 2000s. And that was when I was starting my uh, dissertation work. Uh, in 2001, and my PhD advisor and I, Andy Martin, at the University of Colorado, we set out to try to help with the um, conservation management of cutthroat trout by characterizing the genetic diversity of the modern populations that are extant today. And so what we did is uh, we worked with the federal and state agencies and sampled sort of all the the considered native historic populations of greenback cutthroat trout, but also of Colorado River cutthroat trout over on this side of the divide. And the basic goal of this study and of uh, this dissertation work was to help just baseline characterization of the genetic diversity and the distribution, but also um, it had <clears throat> there was a lot not unknown about the taxonomy of both greenback in Colorado River cutthroat trout. There are a lot of questions of whether they're really different or not because they look very similar. And so part of our goal also was to see are there distinct genetic lineage to support these subspecies. And so this is sort of an overview of sort of the prevailing view of you know, where, <coughs> where the greenback cutthroat trout were native on the front range and the Colorado River cutthroat trout were native on the western slope and with the Rio Grande in the south. And so, so what we did, we, we, didn't really, we didn't work on Rio Grande cutthroat trout in this study. We were surveying populations across what's colored in green and blue here. Um, and I'm just going to show you a little bit of genetic data. from a, our t This is from our 2007 study on the modern samples. And what we found is, I'm showing you three different types of genetic data here, and what's important is that across um, the range of both greenback and Colorado River cutthroat trout, across three different genetic types of genetic markers, we found really good evidence for um, two distinct genetic lineages. Okay, so that was really promising because that's what we'd expect. 
greenback cutthroat trout was one genetic lineage, Colorado River cutthroat trout was, a, was another. But we had some problems. And the problem was that although we had these distinct genetic lineages, um, they were uh, sort of checkerboard across the state distributed. It was like someone just threw them on the state. And so they weren't, what we were expecting was to see a pattern that matched this, where we had uh, populations that assigned to that blue lineage on the west side, to the green lineage on the right side, on the east side. But it's not what we found. And so this kind of left us with a lot of questions. And it could be, it, this pattern could be due to a couple reasons. Um, it could be due to their evolutionary history. So it could be due to the fact that um, these two subspecies haven't been, haven't been diverged for very long. Perhaps they were, even in the very last ice age, able to somehow cross that continental divide. Um, alternatively, uh, the major, the massive efforts of fish propagation and stocking in <clears throat> the early 1900s could potentially also explain this. So if uh, lineages, if, if, if fish had been propagated and moved around to the point where it's just mixing up the lineages over the state. So <clears throat> we, we were able to look at one other, one other aspect of the genetic data to help us get a hint as to which one of these is the more likely answer. Um, so one of our genetic markers that we had used is sort of a really fine resolution, sort of like a forensic fingerprint, and tells you a lot about how similar populations are. And what these red lines here sh are showing is um, each circle is a, is a, is a genetic is a cutthroat trout population. And the red line and the thickness um, is showing how similar they are. And so <clears throat> if this was due to uh, an evolutionary explanation, we might expect for, say, populations like here and here to be really similar, or here and here. What we don't expect is for something in the San Juan drainage to be really similar to something in Rocky Mountain National Park. And so our conclusion is that was that this is probably due to stocking. Unfortunately, um, that means we don't really know what a greenback cutthroat trout is or what any of the subspecies are. We know that it looks like we have distinct subspecies, but we don't know where that green lineage was native or where that blue lineage was native because things have been moved around. And so this is what led us to the historical data. Um, and the first place that we looked was actually, and by we, I mean, this guy up here, Chris Kennedy, who works for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And he had um, also had the inkling that um, fish propagation and stocking had probably played a much bigger role in the distribution of modern populations than previously, than was really sort of, um, sort of imagined or thought uh, at the time. Or what people perceived as the, the, the um, the potential effect of stocking was probably less than in, re than in reality. And so what he did was he went back to all the primary sources of stocking records, um, most of which are in some basement in South Dakota, um, and literally went through each page and make a, made a huge Excel document um, where he recorded over 41,000 stocking records. And this is a big part of the paper that we published in 2012, so it's not actually genetic data, We'll get to that. That's the other half of the paper. But the first half was this, um, this uh, amount of, of stocking data. And what, what this graph shows is the number of salmonids. So that's all. So this is not just cutthroat trout, but rainbow trout and brook trout um, that were stocked. And this is the year. And so what you see here is you start getting, by sort of 1900, you really start ramping up the fish stocking, the fish propagation and stocking. And what these, um, and so what this helped us do is figure out um, what time frame we really need to try to focus to find samples. And so what we tried to do was find museum collections that predated the major stocking uh, efforts. And we were able to find here these arrows show the dates of some of the museum collections that we were able to sample. And I thought one of the really interesting things about this study was is the history. And you know, it's <clears throat> we found out a lot about you know the history of the West and 
what people were doing. So these guys up here are the people who collected the fish samples that I took a little piece of tissue from. You can see the fish samples here. They were uh, basically jars of ethanol that had anywhere from usually like two to seven fish in them. And it didn't smell real great. Um, and, <laughs> and some of them had been dissect dissected previously. Um, and so basically what I did was I took just a tiny little piece of tissue um, from, from these samples. And these fish were collected from all across the state of Colorado um, between the years of 1857 and 1889. And, um, and, <clears throat> and some of these people, I don't know, does anyone here recognize any of these names? Um, Marshall is a, that's Lieutenant William Marshall of, of Marshall Pass between Salida and Gunnison. So some of these people are, you know, kind of real historical figures. David Starr Jordan was the, I don't remember if he's the first president of Stanford, but he was a president of Stanford. He's really, really well-known ichthyologist, so he studied fish. Um, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, and so, so, so these people were, were quite, a, so uh, Luis Agassi, he was, a, uh, he was actually a paleo ichthyologist, and he's, and he's the one who collected the really important specimens in 1871 from the South Platte. So most of the data that I'm going to show about the greenback cutthroat trout, he's the one who collected uh, these samples. And so <clears throat> this is a picture. So the places that we, we sampled from, this is just to show you the number of different populations that we sampled in each of the drainages. And really the focus of this study was the South Platte, um, which is the native range of greenback cutthroat trout. And we were able to get uh, fish from five different localities across the South Platte uh, between the years of 1871 and 1889. Um, and we got these from museums. This is uh, me in 2007 at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, and that's where we got a lot of these samples. Also, the um, Natural Museum in Philadelphia, California Academy of Sciences, and um, the Harvard Museum of I think it's zoology and comparative zoology or something. Um, and this is just a blow up of what some of these fish look like. They didn't look great, but that was actually good news um, because what's sort of a, a, a deal breaker in, in, <clears throat> in, in getting DNA out of preserved specimens is if they're fixed in formalin, which at about 1900 became commercially available. And so our hope, we didn't know beforehand, but our hope was that we were going to get, we were going to find collections that were not fixed in formalin, and we did get lucky in none of the collections that we surveyed. Um, I did try a couple specimens from a different collection in the early 1900s and had no success, and my guess is that they were probably fixed in formalin. So, so it was actually good news that these looked like they were rotting a little bit because it means they weren't fixed. They were just pickled in ethanol for 120 to 150 years, and <clears throat> the DNA was really degraded, but it was just good enough for us to get data. And this is just a, a map of Colorado to show you the number of museum samples we got from each site and each drainage. So we had pretty good coverage. And so just to revisit before I show you the results, what we were expecting. Um, so I've showed you this graph before, so we were sort of expecting to find one subspecies native to the western side of uh, the Continental Divide, uh, and then actually two subspecies along the Front Range, because if you remember I mentioned earlier there was the yellowfin cutthroat trout that went extinct in 1904, and it was supposedly native to only the Twin Lakes um, at the head of the Arkansas River drainage, so near Leadville in Colorado. And we were able to um, sample the type specimen, so what's considered the, the defining specimen. For every species, there's a museum um, specimen that sort of represents that species. And so we were able to uh, sample that for the yellowfin cutthroat trout. And, and then, of course, the, we, we also included in this study a couple of uh, Rio Grande cutthroat trout museum samples. So that was what we were expecting was to find four distinct genetic lineages within these museum samples that we surveyed. 
And so what we found actually was six. Um, and so this is a phylogenetic tree that's very common, that um, way to view genetic sequence data. And it just shows the evolutionary history of these different subspecies. So this is rainbow trout, the sister taxa. And in gray here um, are all the other major subspecies with the triangle just representing the, the genetic diversity within the subspecies. And colored here are all the, um, from here down are all the groups that we found in Colorado. And so what it actually appears that we had here um, in historic times was six subspecies, one of which was um, uh, native to the Yampa White River drainage, one that was native to both the Gunnison and Colorado, which makes sense because these two rivers um, coalesce not very far back, and so they could probably swim from one drainage to the other. Um, and then one surprising thing is we found um, a slightly different, it's not terribly divergent, but um, a different subspecies in the San Juan drainage. And then we found <coughs> that the fish that was native to the South Platte was not native to the Arkansas River drainage. And what was native to the Arkansas River drainage was that um, yellowfin specimen, was that yellowfin subspecies that we sampled in the museum. Um, we did find, actually, from one of our later samples, 1889, we did find one of this subspecies here. And so we're still not certain about the Arkansas River if it had one or two subspecies because 1889 was uh, just a couple years after the Leadville hatchery had started and Twin Lakes had a lot of fish stocking propagation. So we can't be certain about that, but what we can be really certain about was all nine samples from the South Platte from those five different localities, all were one very well supported, very divergent genetic lineage. And, and so that let us know what the greenback cutthroat trout is. So then the question is, um, is, so which one of these six subspecies is actually still alive today, right? Because we, we know some of them aren't. And so um, I'm gonna get into this a little bit more later, but we do have one remaining population of this lineage um, left today. But first I'm gonna take a little, uh, little side story that I think is just interesting <laughs> um, and tell you about it. So, and you can, this is an interesting side story, but it was also a very frustrating side story um, that we had to deal with. So this guy, Hammond, um, who collected the, he collected some, some samples in 1857. Okay, so these are our earliest samples. And because they were the earliest samples, um, they became, they were used as a type specimen in the museums. Okay, but the problem was, well, so the greenback type specimen was assigned to one of the specimens that Hammond collected. But there had always been some ambiguity about where this sam these samples were collected, as in, um, so let me tell you what. So basically, the type specimens of greenback turned out to be Rio Grande cutthroat trout, which was not what I was looking for because the whole idea here is that the museum samples are what you trust to be accurate, and that's what we're trying to use as our baseline information. Um, and so this, then we had to do some digging. I mean, these samples, even in Benke's book about trout, he talks about the type specimens, and there's been problems with the labels and relabeling. And so this wasn't, you know, this wasn't like totally out of the blue, but it was certainly a complication. Um, and so Kevin Rogers, who works for Colorado Parks and Wildlife, started doing some digging into uh, the history of the labels of these specimens. And so originally, the problem was originally the only label was Fort Riley, Kansas, 1856. There's no cutthroat trout in Kansas, and there hasn't been. And so they obviously, but there was, this is where the army base was, and this was a, Hammond was an army surgeon. And so, but then later, um, 
sort of when in 1871, when Cope was defining greenback, he, him and some other people had decided that most likely um, these were actually collected in 1857 when Hammond was on an expedition that they thought went through, that went through the Platte River, okay? Um, and so <clears throat> Kevin Rogers actually got the original field notes from the museum in Philadelphia, and he used the field notes, which uh, were extremely detailed, to actually retrace where um, that 1857 expedition went. And so what you have here, I think, here's Colorado. And the South Platte's down here. And actually, the expedition never went in the South Platte. So these samples were not collected in 1857 in the South Platte. Now, there was an 1856 expedition that went through the South Platte, but Hammond was not on it. And so, after doing more and more research, um, Kevin came across a few letters uh, that sort of suggested um, Hammond spent some time in Santa Fe. Was, in 1855, he had the intent to spend some time in Santa Fe, which I just included this because it has a really strange um, <laughs> strange reasoning, he was after a brain of an Indian. He was a surgeon. Anyway, and so, and then 1856, there's this letter, some time ago, I sent a large box of birds, reptiles, etc., to the academy. Has anyone received them? And this would have been from Santa Fe, and the um, genetics of these uh, greenback-type specimens actually match exactly a contemporary population that's right outside of Santa Fe. So we think we solved that. Unfortunately, that left us with some issues with the name and taxonomy of greenback cutthroat trout. Um, and for now, we've, we argued in our paper that since in 1871, when Koch described Oncorhynchus clarke stomius, the subspecies greenback, he, his intent was to describe it for the South Platte. Unfortunately, he chose a sample not from the South Platte, that we should keep greenback as the native of the South Platte, and not as a secondary name for Rio Grande cutthroat trout, because that would be sad if our state fish ch changed. <laughs> so hopefully that will hold, but that was sort of a side story that we weren't expecting and took up a lot of time, and we finally figured out. So anyway, getting back to the overall story. So today, <clears throat> what I'm showing here is, so we still need to explain why we have the current distribution of cutthroat that we have. And so today, um, so what I'm showing on this map Underneath, the rivers are colored according sort of to our new hypothesis based on the historic specimen. So, you know, each, sub, each major drainage had a different subspecies. And on top, the pie charts show the um, proportion of populations in each drainage um, that assign to each of these colored lineages today. So. Um, the background map is where we think things were uh, historically, and the pie charts are what's there now. Okay, so the Yampadrina looks pretty native, it has only finding the, the lineage of fish that we think was native there before, and the same with the Rio Grande. But then we have, um, uh, we have in the San Juan drainage, we have almost completely the populations that we, uh, the lineage that we think was native here. And on the, the front way, range, we have a mix. And what you'll note here, this is purple. So actually, the only population we have of this lineage, this subspecies that we represent with purple, is actually in a small population in the Arkansas River drainage outside of Colorado Springs. Um, and ironically, it's a stock population. So it's along the, the it's on the, it's uh, in the Pikes Peak area. It's in an area that was originally fishless. And the, again, Kevin Rogers and Chris Kennedy, our two historians for this, did a lot of research in the hotelier that lived in that area and that owned that land. Um, if he wanted to drive and go get some cutthroat trout to stock into his stream, which is what was very common, um, because a lot of these mountain streams were fishless because of waterfall barriers. And so, you know, the, com the, the smart thing to do was to go uh, get some fish 
um, either from a federal hatchery or state hatchery or from some local resource and dump them in your stream, and they did well. And so um, in 1870s, in the mid-1870s, there's documents that um, the person who owned this land stocked it with fish. And by car, the closest place that he would have been able to drive to get fish would have been right over um, into the South Platte, which is probably what happened. And so ironically, the only reason we have a South Platte fish today is because someone grabbed it and stocked it in the Arkansas River drainage. It's a confusing story. OK, so the next question, um, as we sort of wrapped it up, is, OK, so you'll notice here there's a whole lot of blue and green. So how did these two um, subspecies that are represented by blue and green that are native to the West Slope become so widespread? So this is, again, where the stocking data became really important. And what Chris Kennedy did um, for this project is with those f over 41,000 stocking records, he figured out, he tallied um, for the major uh, fish hatcheries at that time where the fish came from, how many and how many were put where. And so this distribution of today of where green, green and blue populations are everywhere is because the two main hatcheries that generated millions and millions of fish were um, from the Grand Lakes, which would have been this green lineage, and then from Trappers and Marvine Lake, which would have been the blue lineage. And here, the, these maps show stocking records that are really complete between the years of 1899 and 1909, and then 1914 and 1925. And the thickness of the line is how many fish um, the thickest line is 4 million, uh, were stocked into the various counties, which you can't really see with this resolution. But the point is, the reason we have these two lineages everywhere today is because they were propagated in the millions and um, distributed by the railroad um, to a lot of co counties in Colorado. And this is just a picture of Trapper's Lake. Um, which was a nice big lake, and here you can see this is where the um, sort of the hatchery propagation setup was, or still is. And so the overall story here that we have put together with this research is that cutthroat trout in Colorado uh, suffered major declines because of overfishing, uh, mining pollution was actually a really big thing here, and then this was followed by a massive effort of fish propagation and stocking that basically overwrote sort of the native uh, diversity and distribution of the subspecies in Colorado, which is why it was so difficult when just sampling modern populations to figure out what was going on. And these are just some uh, historic photos showing, um, you know, we can look at these numbers of stockings, but also looking at the, the photos of these stocking efforts which are a little hard to see, but basically you have people hiking up into the mountains with these milk canisters or, uh, or sort of metal cans tied to their back um, full of baby trout and dumping them into fishless streams and lakes. And, and this was, I mean, this was a very big, big and very successful effort. Um, and so where does that leave that us? Uh, so, Based on our research that we recently published, our conclusion was, you know, if you consider the South Platte, the native, um, the, the subspecies native to the South Platte, the greenback, um, that means that we only have one population of greenback left. Um, and so, you know, it's a reasonable question, what do you do with one population of, of fish? Um, well, first of all, we do what we can do really well, and we know we can do really well for cutthroat trout. We bring them in. We bring some small sample of those fish into a hatchery. And this isn't my work. My work ends at the genetic data. But uh, they are, uh, the federal and state managers are uh, propagating this uh, population um, in a couple hatcheries. And I would assume the final goal would be to restore them to some of the, <coughs> some of the streams and rivers of the South Platte. And that's me at the Leadville 
fish hatchery where you can go see the Bear Creek greenback cutthroat trout. Um, <clears throat> and so I have a lot of people who worked on this research with me, some of which are listed here, including Andy Martin, who was my PhD advisor and is a professor at CU. Um, and then, very importantly, Kevin Rogers from, well, Co Colorado Parks and Wildlife, no longer Division of Wildlife, um, and Chris Kennedy from U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And then the uh, Australian Center for Ancient DNA, which is where I really got this project working, um, along with uh, a small biotech company who helped some in the beginning, Pisces Molecular, which is in Boulder. And this research was funded by um, basically the Greenback Recovery Team, which is uh, made up of Colorado Parks and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Forest Service, Rocky Mountain National Park, Trout Unlimited, and BLM. And, <clears throat> and then finally, of course, this wouldn't have been possible without the museums uh, agreeing to let me destructively sample a small bit of tissue or bone from their fish collections, and everybody was very generous, and so we definitely appreciate that, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh. Way to listen to that. Yes? Is there indication that the uh, greenback is better on the front range, or does it do better elsewhere? Um, I don't... I don't, with only one population left, I don't think we know. So the good news is that that one population that's left is in a really small stream. You can literally step over it, and it's probably been there for 120 years, and it's fine. The fish are really small because it's a small stream, but it's fine, and we don't know, and we, have, we do have a lot of questions about what is the, the health of those fish. Are they suffering from inbreeding depression? But again, right now all we know is that they're there, and they've been there, and they seem to be reproducing fine, both in, the, in that stream, but also in the hatcheries, so. Yeah. So I'm confused now. Um, yeah, this is a tricky have, story, so. So do we have greenback lineage and Colorado River lineage, or do we have six lineages? We have six lineages. Can you repeat the question? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. His question um, is, so now, do we just do we do we still have greenback and Colorado River cutthroat, or do we have six lineages? And so the answer is that you're correct. This is confusing, and one of the main findings is that we didn't just have the Colorado River greenback extinct yellowfin and Rio Grande, but we had two others. One subspecies that was native to the San Juan, um, and <clears throat> is that a most likely. Um, we'll see what modern, I assure you, there's, they're sampling every population down there, so <laughs> they're looking hard for it. Um, and so, and then we, yeah, so we had the, now I've lost count. Right, so we have, yeah, and one of the big differences is that we have the Yampa and White River, which will probably remain um, Oncorhynchus clarki pleuriticus, which is the Colorado River cutthroat trout, because the type specimens come from the Yampa. And so now that means we have an unnamed subspecies. Yeah, so basically, basically my research will go under review by a panel of other, of independent people in the spring. And so if it's upheld, <laughs> We don't have a name for that. It'll need a name. This will stay O.C. pleuriticus. Hopefully this will stay O.C. stomius. This will stay uh, the yellowfin, which was O.C. McDonaldi. This was fine. It's uh, O.C. virginalis, Rio Grande. And then this is unnamed. So we have, you're correct. So we would have six instead of four. So then what's the status of? Uh, the purple? Would be, yeah. So those are what we we would consider. We considered in the paper the real O.C. stomius or greenback cutthroat trout because Cope defined greenback O.C. stomius as a South Platte fish in 1871, although he was actually pointing towards a Rio Grande. So we'll see. So stomius doesn't mess. occur in the Yampa, Colorado, Colorado. Correct. 
Just in bad taste. Yes, just in. So right now, uh, that purple lineage shown here, so the native of the South Platte is in nature in one place, Bear Creek near Colorado Springs, is close to fishing, and in some hatcheries. So given like the dispersal or the bifurcation of some of these species, um, like are there other lakes? I mean, it, it seems like maybe it's possible that there would be other lakes or small creeks that, um, that would have some other species in them. Is that? So basically, Okay, so his question is about the distribution of subspecies in, in Colorado and whether maybe there's some other lakes or streams that could potentially have subspecies we don't know about. Is that sort of your question? Well, not necessarily new ones, but within the six. Like, if the deck was shuffled, but I can't, I just, it seems like you can't, like, I have seen a lot of these fish. Uh-huh. They're very similar. So the thing to remember, these are subspecies. So they are part of the same species. The Endangered Species Act does protect subspecies in distinct populations. So that's why they are protected. Um, but some of the confusion has definitely been uh, because many cutthroat, the cutthroat trout do look somewhat similar, but this was also partly cutthroat trout were the, the Colorado River and Greenback were thought to look similar because they were actually looking at the same fish across the Continental Divide. And so now, so one of the studies that's going on now, independently of ours, um, because of the, the ESA implications, is a morphological study of those Bear Creek fish, and it's being done by a different group at CSU, to see if the Bear Creek Greenbacks are different than the other subspecies of contemporary cutthroat trout. And if they find that they are morphologically different, um, you know, it's another line of evidence. So this is a, this is a unique, uh, you know, a unique pool of genetic diversity that's worth trying to conserve. So do different species look differently? Do uh, different subspecies look differently? So the question is, do the different subspecies look differently? A lot of them do. And let me go back to... But even within single subspecies? Is there a lot of, yeah? Uh, within a single subspecies, um, there's some, there can definitely be variation, especially that's driven by whether they're in a stream or a lake and what they're eating. So um, things can look more orange if their diet consists of uh, some small organism that has a lot of orange pigment. Um, and in lakes, they get a lot bigger, um, which partly caused the issue, the problem with the, the yellowfin, which was thought to only be uh, uh, native to twins la Twin Lakes, and that was because the lake fish looked so different from the Arkansas River fish, because the river fish were much smaller, um, and so they thought those were two different subspecies. But this is, um, <coughs> these are photos of different cutthroat trout subspecies, and as you can see, some of them look quite different, and some of them look fairly similar, um, especially sort of the greenback cutthroat trout and the Rio Grande cutthroat trout. A lot of those look fairly similar, and it makes sense because they're fairly closely related subspecies. Are you planning to do that? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so the question is, is it possible to introduce a game fish into a, a stream or lake with cutthroat trout and not decimate it? Yes, and that's one of the major causes of decline is rainbow trout, brown trout, and um, brook trout, which all can either outcompete and or in the case of rainbow trout also hybridize with, with the cutthroat trout. But like I said, especially in Colorado, the cut, most of the cutthroat trout didn't evolve with other fish. Um, they were, and so they're not, they haven't, they're not adapted for competition. They, they, def, they don't stand a chance against a, a brook trout or a brown trout, so. 
So you don't have, they aren't introducing those in these areas. Yeah, so basically now, um, what you have in, so most mountain streams and lakes were originally fishless, like Rocky Mountain National Park, most of those, uh, most of those, a lot of the water was fishless because it was above a major barrier, like a, a major waterfall. And so now all the waters below that that once had cutthroat trout all have rainbow brook and brown trout. And what we've done instead is use that barrier as an advantage in most of the restoration populations, most of those cutthroat trout populations have been stuck above the waterfalls. So um, actually, so, and that's a whole other issue, um, is putting a fish into an originally fishless stream or lake obviously changes the ecosystem. Maybe it's not good for the frogs, but that's, that's the state of affairs right now. So that was a very good question. Well, I'm from Wisconsin, and the giant carp are coming up the Mississippi, and they could just decimate all the sport fishing in the Great Lakes if they mm -hmm. you know, we're, Yep. We're so, so the difference between uh, the situation with the Great Lakes um, and the carp invasion. I don't know what the barriers are there, but here we have, I mean, we sort of have uh, put our cutthroat trout into these little refugias above really big waterfalls, unless someone literally picks up a bucket of, and puts them up on the other side of that waterfall. Um, they're pretty safe from those brown and brook trout. So most of the, man you know, the waters of Colorado is certainly managed partly for recreation and partly for conserving native diversity, but those recreation populations are usually somewhere that's not going to be able to invade the populations that are being managed for uh, native species recovery. It's complicated business. <laughs> So the question, how many? So the question is, how many? How successful do you have to be in getting uh, amount? So there's two things: amount of DNA, so the amount of sequence data, and also the number of fish. Um, and that's a really good question. We need. Um, so basically, I don't have a. There's not a real firm answer for that. Um, we. We were able to run statistics in ours and get good support. And we used 30 fish from across uh, the state of Colorado. And we had 450 base pairs of mitochondrial sequence data, which probably doesn't mean anything. But, um, and so it was a, it's a small amount of sequence data. But for that modern data set, we have way more data. And so what we did for the museum data set is we took a subset of the sequence data from the modern data set that we knew was, was very useful for determining subspecies, and that's what we focused on for the museum data set, if that sort of makes sense. For each of these subspecies, you could have a library of data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, um, I have to repeat the question, sorry, um, is are we, so would the DNA that we've retrieved from these specimens potentially be useful in the future? And absolutely. And the remaining DNA extracts from this museum work are in a minus 80 freezer at the University of Colorado, along with the extra tissue specimens that I, part of the tissue that I didn't use. We also have that archived, so. Yes, that's a very good question. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you.